because of the above. In front of the nation, either God, in the midst of the world, with liberty and justice for all. Victor, would you lead us in prayer tonight? Father God in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful day that you've given us. We thank you for this time that you've allowed us to come together. God, we ask that you will guide us into all truth, that you will put all the pieces of the puzzle together, God, that way we can glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You need a roll call, please? Councillor Howard? It's a Here. Councillor Lorenz? Here. Councillor Watson? Here. Where is she? Mayor Pro Tem Sibilla? Here. Mayor Decker? Here. A quorum is declared. Have any modifications to the agenda? Uh, yes, sir. I would ask that we modify the agenda, adding I-1, a modification to liquor license to the Alta Convenience Store number 633. 6339 located at 1025 Park Avenue, which used to be the Shell gas station. Make a motion to approve the addition to the agenda. Seconded. Been moved and seconded to approve the modification to the agenda. Is there any more discussion? You need a Councillor Howard? Yes. Councillor Lorenz? Aye. Councilor Watson? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sickle? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to modify the agenda, adding I-1, modification to liquor license to the Alta Convenience number 6339, located at 1025 Park Avenue, previously the Shell gas station. Any approval of the consent agenda, minutes from regular meeting from March 21st, 2024, and a re review and approval of accounts payable. Like to make a motion to uh, for the approval of the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda from the minutes of regular meeting from March 21st, 2024, and review and approval of accounts payable. Is there any discussion? You need a Councillor Howard? <laughs> yes. Councillor Lorenz? Aye. Councillor Watson? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sicola? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve the consent agenda. All right, we will move on to citizen comments. City Council welcomes your unscheduled comments. Please limit your comments to three minutes and council will not take action at this meeting. Margo, you can't hide from me. <laughs> well, I do have a concern, so I, I don't know if this is the right place. Hello, everybody, good to be here. It's been a beautiful day and Ross, you guys are doing a great job in the parks. They are really looking nice. My concern is this. Uh, when you come out the alley by the legacy, when you come out to get onto 160, there is a sign, four by fours in the ground, a sign, huge sign, Blue Moon Bay Painting. And if you come and look, you know, stop to see for traffic, you cannot see the traffic coming from the West. And I don't know who authorized that or did they authorize it or who do I talk to? The sign's gotta be moved. Somebody's gonna get T-boned. I mean, you cannot see the cars unless you pull out into traffic. And if you pull back, then you can't see if there's a car there. Because it's, it's such a big sign. It's kind of like just like the trees on the same highway. Yeah, only this pull. is worse. You have to no, pull this is really it. bad. If you leave, check it out. I, I drove by there today and went in the alley, and you cannot see traffic coming so, from the so west. So is there a, everybody apply for a sign permit for that? I, I don't know if they did or not. I know the legacy is doing some interior uh, improvements. Yes. And well, so I think, it's so it's a temporary, now. yeah, so it's a. But temporary. it's, I mean, four by four yeah. posts in the ground for the sign. And it, well, it's those just, posts have always been there. They, we, they have? So, yeah, they've oh, been there forever. I didn't know that. We occasionally put signs up there for uh, the legacy elderly week. Sure. You know what I mean? Like it's not, yeah. there's not signs there all the time, but there is somebody doing renovation. Okay. Just to let you know that it is a concern. Okay. 
Okay. Thank, Thank you. And you all looking good. Thank you. City's Marco. looking good too. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Scheduled appearance. In order to be on this, included on this portion of the agenda, you have to fill out the appropriate paperwork with the city clerk no later than noon by Monday prior to the meeting. Larry Brown, Ag Conference update and 4-H update. Thank you, Council and and uh, Niji for Anita for uh, inviting us here and working with it. Uh, we have a I have a letter here that I will I didn't make them up for all councils, but I'll I'll put them up here on the DG. I'm not going to read the whole letter, but. The Ag Conference this year was definitely one for the for the uh, record books, and I just want to express my gratitude to the to the city and the council and Gigi for all the support that you've given um, in in all ways to to support the conference. The Sky High facility is fantastic. Uh, it's really revolutionized the way that we can uh, offer our educational program the, uh, at the conference. This year we had uh, congruent sessions going in four rooms at a time. Uh, a total of 44 educational sessions with approximately 60 uh, speakers and presenters all together. Uh, Jason helped us with several of the, of the presentations at the conference this year. We're starting to rebuild our relationship extension with the consulting companies around the, the valley as well. So we're starting to get that uh, put back together that we once had. So we really appreciate that kind of support and, and participation as well. But uh, uh, great educational program. We had good reviews on that. Um, as we rebuild that educational side of the program better and better, uh, it also seems to be uh, drawing in more and more vendors to the trade show and encouraging more and more sponsorships uh, and that kind of support. So all of those things have been working together. The, the chamber has been great to work with as far as them running. They run the trade show side of the things and the extension runs the the, uh, the educational side of things. So uh, so it's just been great, uh, everything that's that's happened to to support that and help us rebuild that that, that whole program. Uh, I think our, our keynote address by Dr. Temple Grannon this year, of course, was one of the big draws that really helped us. Uh, we were really thrilled with, with the participation, the educational registration a year ago in, in 2023. Uh, it was 380 total registrants, and we were really thrilled with that. And this year's registration really dwarfed it. Uh, we had 640. Um, so that was extremely up. A large part of that was because of Temple Grandin, but not all of it. Uh, we had a growth uh, in the registration just because of the quality of the educational program as well. Uh, but I think during Temple Grandin's um, keynote address, I think we were within 30 or 40 people of being in maximum capacity. Uh, not just in the banquet room, but in the banquet room and all three of the, the side rooms. So, so that was uh, very exciting, and a few of us were sweating with us through part of that as well. So, uh, so just thank you for that. Uh, I can't express enough how good and professional um, Stephanie Ruball and her team there at the at Sky High is. Um, I'm at different conferences in different cities, uh, Fort Collins on campus. Uh, there's very few that that are as responsive and professional and service oriented as your team is. Um, and there's a whole lot of them that aren't anywhere close to what your team is. And so I just I hope that you uh, do realize that um, what you have in that team and, and they worked with me prior to the conference. Uh, and going through and fine tooth comb the, the IT system, the audio visual system, and they worked out bugs. They worked out a process by which we could live stream from the main banquet room to the three side rooms during that keynote address. They really went over and above the call of duty and, and served us so well. And during the course of the conference, the, the thousand mini crises that I had, and they were right there and solved them in an instant or two, and we just went on. So it's just it's just really great to have you know, that kind of support. So DOS was a big part of just walked in of getting that IT stuff worked out for us. So with that, um, 
if you're interested, I don't know what if you want it for your your um, records or anything, but we do have a we do have a uh, one of the conference brochures here. Uh, not this year, but last year we were co-sponsors of an economic impact study um, um, done on the conference, and this is the final report. I think this has probably already been presented to you by Jim Clare. But anyway, uh, we have a final report here. One of the things it did point out is the majority of the out-of-town visitors stay in Alamosa instead of uh, Monta Vista for their lodging. And so from that standpoint, it does point to the, the likelihood that a new hotel here would potentially shift that towards Monta Vista. So any questions about the, the Ag Conference? So so grateful for for all everything that you've done to make that that facility and and everything else happen to, to help us improve that conference. So uh, we'll shift from there then into talking about our 4-H program. And uh, I've been back with Extension. I had a tour of duty with Extension as a livestock uh, specialist for the Valley back in the mid '80s to mid '90s, and then I resigned to go into business, um, self-employed which I did for 26 years, S still have our businesses. I just don't pay close enough attention to them these days that I'm doing now the, the extension. But but um, when I was here before, it was a very robust program. We had seven agents plus Dwayne Steinhardt, and they remember him was a farm management uh, specialist. And most of our positions are, are, are co-funded um, by, by the county and then by the state, by CSU. Um, when I resigned in 1995, there were seven agent positions plus Dwayne's farm management position. Um, I didn't pay any attention to extension for about 20 years. And then I was asked to get back on the advisory board, which is how our program works is with advisors. And uh, when I came back as an advisor in 2016, uh, left in 1995 with basically eight agents, I came back as an advisor in 2016 to three agents for the entire valley. And when I talk about what we do, we're education. We are related to the research station and we work together, but their research and we're education. But uh, I was the livestock agent. There was an agronomist, uh, Merle Dillon. Some of you know and remember him. There was a potato specialist at the time, extension potato specialist. There was two uh, 4-H youth agents, uh, a home in those days called Home Ec Agent. Now it's family consumer science. And then the director that, that Heard it all, you know, all of us chickens, and then also did some community development sort of work. Uh, so I came back, and there was only three agents left to cover all aspects of that sort of education through the valley. And so we we went about rebuilding, and we were able to get some special funding for a for a special youth agent to work with with the development of helping, especially the underprivileged kids graduate high school at a better rate, go on to some sort of post uh, high school training or education. I was able to get special funding to bring strictly from CSU to bring in a new agent who just started the first of March in the ag arena, uh, working on all the all the changes in the production practices uh, due to and because of our uh, cutting back on the water in our, in our agriculture. So we're able to get those things accomplished, but the one thing that we never could find the extra funding for uh, was a second 4-H agent. Historically, we've had two 4-H agents to cover all six valley uh, counties in the valley with the youth. That's never been enough, but we've always made it work. Um, but I came back and there was only one agent for the youth. And it's been 14 years since we had two. And in that 14 years, it's not like we had one agent that entire 14 years because one would come and they'd burn out and there'd be a gap in time. And then another one come and they'd burn out and then there'd be a gap in time. So um, uh, we went about the idea that we're going to have to start an endowment in order to have a second 4-H agent. And in that process, we, we uh, uh, I was advised to talk to somebody in the community who's done this sort of a, a large undertaking before since I never had. So we started talking to Carla Shriver and she gave us lots of good advice. Um, one of the outcomes of that, uh, unexpected, was that Carla came forward from the Alt Cal Foundation and they gifted us enough funding for three years to hire our second 4-H agent, and, and this is Molly Wells. Uh, she's been with us now since February 12th, and she's gonna go ahead and uh, give you a little bit of, of um, information on where we currently are with the rebuilding of the 4-H program and enrollment. 
uh, valley-wide in a remote enrollment specifically in Rio Grande County and in an equity specifically from one of us in some volume in the third or two for a moment. Good evening. Um, so our enrollment for the 4-H program ended on March 17th for this year. Um, so the last few weeks I've been crunching numbers trying to figure out um, how to break this apart per county um, and also per town. Um, right now we have 16 clubs in the whole valley. Out of those 16 clubs, six of those are here in Rio Grande County. Um, as far as members go, we have a total of 310 members in the whole valley and 123 of those are enrolled in Rio Grande County. Out of that 123, 77 of them live here in Monta Vista. So as you can tell, a large percentage of our 4-H kids are coming from Rio Grande County uh, and Monta Vista, living directly in Monta Vista. Um, we have a few clover buds, which is our little guys that are learning what 4-H is. Um, and so hopefully we'll get them enrolled in a few years. And we have about three of them here in Rio Grande County. Um, we have 55 approved volunteers and those are our adults that come in and help. Um, we can't run this program without our volunteers. Um, they help us reach all the counties across the valley. And we have 55 of those approved. And out of those 55, 17 of them are living directly here in Monta Vista. Um, so even though enrollment has closed, we are still actually doing what we're gonna call 4-H nights. Um, and those are gonna be held once, once a month. Uh, and those are gonna be a program where Kids that are not enrolled in 4-H, but are interested, not quite sure if they're ready to commit, um, we're gonna put on a little project um, that's 4-H related, bring them in, kind of give them an idea of what a, a club meeting looks like and let them do a project. So hopefully by next year, we can get them recruited. So we've been busy with that. Um, we're always busy getting ready for fair and getting our kids going. So that's what we have going on. So any, any questions for Molly? What were numbers like? Go back. Do you know the numbers from a couple of years ago? Um, not right now, but I can probably go back and look them up and find out. I mean, I know that we have grown over the last couple of years, um, but specific numbers I'd have to go back and look. When we, uh, uh, in the old good days, in the 80s and 90s, where there were fewer um, competing things for youth to do, and when we had some consistency in the program, I remember in the 80s and 90s, some of the enrollments Valley White uh, approaching the 700 uh, member mark. So compared to that, we have a lot of rebuilding and a lot of potential to do. We also have a lot of a lot of things that 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 uh, compete for the for the kids and the family's time these days. Um, when when I came back in in uh, 2021, halfway through 2021, and that was also when Morgan Young was hired as uh, the 4-H agent at the same time. I think it had been two and a, at least two years since we'd had a 4-H agent at that time. Uh, we came back to an enrollment of 286, and that was uh, youth members and the volunteer leaders combined. So, so we've we've grown that uh, by a fair amount. When when we first came back, and the excitement of that, and uh, of, of of having a 4-H agent again, uh, there was a there was a spike. Uh, we actually enrolled about almost 400 that first year. Uh, when the families, uh, I think it was as much the parents as the as the kids, when they found out what a robust and demanding program that this 4-H program is, uh, I think many of them thought that this was just going to be a, another place that they could drop off their kids as a babysitting thing. When they found out that there's actually project work involved, that there's record books involved, this this whole training of of business and leadership um, and community service projects and and that whole thing, I think it was a little bit more involved than what some of the parents thought. So we didn't maintain that. We kind of come back down, but now we're stabilizing and growing at that. Point. So so that's a little bit of the the history is as I know it a long time ago and in the last few years. We're also working on ways to retain these kids. Um, Jenea is working on um, our livestock judging team to go to state conference. Um, her program, she had three kids last year. I think this year she has 10 maybe that are competing to be on the 
seniors and we're trying to work on getting some a livestock football team going so we're just really trying to get things that the kids are going to be interested in and hopefully keep them for long terms so with the with the gift from Alcal, we were able to move forward with with hiring molly um and now we have we have launched the endowment campaign um as so many other things that i've done since i've been back i've been informed larry uh, nobody else does it this way Usually an endowment happens when somebody comes forward and walks into your office and says, I have a million dollars or two million or whatever uh, that we'd like to start this endowment. And so we didn't have that. So we, we started uh, right at the bottom building up. And so we've got quite a, quite a lift to, to do. Um, we, we will need to raise between two and a half and three million. Uh, the CSU Foundation endowments were allowed to use 4%. You know, once we reach the the amount that we're going to call that that this is the endowment, we can then use four percent of that on an annual basis, and so uh, we we aren't just covering the the salary of this individual. We're also covering all the benefits and all the fringe. Uh, as as you all know, that adds another almost forty percent to fifty percent on top of that. Uh, we're also trying to have enough in there that we can uh, supply some of the programming needs, the, the supplies to teach the kids and this sort of thing. So we're looking at two and a half to three million dollars in order. And, you know, when I when I left here uh, in, in 1995 or left Extension in 95, I've always been in the Valley. But in 95, uh, I, you know, I wasn't thinking ahead. All of a sudden, 30 some odd years later, I look back and it's amazing how quick three decades can go by. So my thinking now is more, what do we need to do to make sure that that it's still here 30 years from now? And, and so it's gonna need that two and a half to three million when it's all said and done. Uh, we, uh, we are currently at about 70,000. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, small donations, medium-sized donations, all donations count. Um, we, the CPAC, committee uh, voted to do a $25,000 uh, matching donation. When all other donations reached 25, they would contribute 25, which has happened. And so that's how we went from 25 to 50. And then, like I say, we're almost up to 70 now. So we have, um, we don't have a, a really tight time limit on how long we have to, to reach that goal uh, of the two and a half to three million uh, because of the way it's structured. Our, our time our, our time goal comes from the fact that we've got three years of, of funding right now for Molly and uh, we, we want we want to have hopefully that that built by that time so that we can go immediately permanently into position but getting that accomplished is going to have at least that one youth position that's that's going to be immune to the fluctuations of the county budgets and the fluctuations of the CSU budgets and and give us some stability here that we haven't had in in, in a decade and a half. So that's that's the whole the thought process behind it and the why that we're doing it. And if if the city council were so inclined and and felt like it was a, a something that you could do, we would we would always gratefully accept any any donation to our endowment that, that you would. And if and if that's a possibility, uh, which we're pretty ready. Have you talked to Will Electric? We have. Uh, we have actually already received ten thousand dollars from REC. And we've been invited to now that they realize what it really was about. We've been invited to come back. Then they come back and talk to them again. Any other questions or directives for us? Or with your numbers that you have, do you have it broke down between livestock and indoor? Yeah, I, I haven't, but I can definitely get online and do that. For um, H online, we we have the ability to do that. Our livestock um, exhibits at the fair has been growing. I think this year it may have stabilized, uh, at least on the cattle side, it's stabilized and come down a little bit. I think the other smaller species are up. Um, the indoor projects, again, just since I've been back, have um, at least doubled. So we're, we're starting to, to gain on that some. So. That's good. Yeah, that was one thing when Morgan came back, she really pushed for the kids to at least try one indoor project. So that was definitely growing. Silence. So. Somali, where do you come from? Um, I grew up in western Kansas. Um, and then I went to college up in Nebraska, College of Technical Agriculture up in Curtis, Nebraska. And then I transferred down to Carleton State, Seattle, Texas. Um, I moved to Del Norte 
Oh, about 15 years ago, and I was helping Jenny Malblanc with the goat dairy out there and running my own business. Um, and then about four years ago, I moved down to San Luis with my partner and been helping him and running the ranch down there with him. And my kids are in 4-H too, and I've been a 4-H volunteer, so it kind of motivated me to make sure this program keeps on going. Jenny's been uh, the co-leader of, of one of the most active clubs in the in the valley for uh, you know for four years. Very good. Well, thank 4 you very much. The four H to me is one of the best projects of our because it teaches a lot of responsibility. So, and I spent eighteen years on the fair board, so. I actually put about 20 years in, but 18 years on the fair board. When I left the fair board is when kids that were like seniors or juniors at that time, their kids started coming in. I was like, okay, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank was, you guys for what you do. That was my first comment that first summer we, we were back at the fair. Uh, at our required exhibitor meeting, you know, everybody play fair, behave yourself, have fun, do a good job and all that. And, uh, and I told the kids there, I said, if any of you need to, I've got stories on most of your parents. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, guys. Larry. thank you, Molly. Thank you. All right. We will go to uh, license and liquor renewals. <clears throat> So, Nita? Good evening, Council. Um, I put in front of all of you a couple of maps. So, I'm bringing before you a modification for the Alta convenience store located at 1025 Park Avenue. It used to be the Shell gas station. Um, so they I brought before you back in January, their liquor license. They applied for a beer and wine license. Can you all approve that liquor license? In the meantime, they have started a remodel of that gas station. And they have sent to the state a modification for their liquor license. The state has actually already approved that modification. What they wanted to do is on the one that says current before remodel, you can see where they have two little coolers that say FB, FMB and wine. That's fermented malt beverage and wine. Those were the, where they were going to store the, the wine and beer. Um, since then, they have asked for a modification. So if you remember when it was the Shell gas station, you would walk in and they had a little seating area um, facing 160. There was a seating area and then the bay windows. Um, the bay windows are going to have to be closed off. Um, they aren't going to have the bay windows there anymore, but they've asked for that to be turned into a beer cave. So they're still going to have the two little coolers to house the beer, and then they'll have a walk-in beer cave. So that would be their modification for their liquor license. The state has already approved that. So I'm bringing, I did speak with our city attorney, um, it is not a huge modification to the license. They are just adding that walk-in area. Anybody have any questions for you, Anita? No. So what is the, like now it says back of house, on the second one. <clears throat> so that's just the the back of the building. Yeah. 
That's all that is, is just the back of their building. So that food service windows, that's where they sell their burritos? Yes. So it'd be storage. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's that's where they have storage currently. Huh? And Randy Kern, um, the Rio Grande County Building Department, um, he will not allow them to have those windows there if they're going to have the beer cave. So the windows cannot be there with the beer cave. And that's already been discussed with Randy. So I'm just asking for council's approval to modify that with the license. Okay. Second. Removed in second and for approve the modifications to the <clears throat> contract for the Alpha Fuel liquor license. Is there any more discussion? Anita? Councilor Howard? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Councilor Watson? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aye. Mayor Beckers? Aye. Motion carries to approve the modification. Liquor license modification to Alta number 6339, located in 1025 Park Avenue. Thank you. I'm just going to stay here. Are you doing the second reading? I am. Okay. Second reading of Orden. Orden. Second reading of Ordinance. 925 amending chapter 12 3 260 of the Monte Vista Municipal Code. So, you all approved the first reading. Would you like me to do it or do you want to do it? I can do it if you want. Okay, I'm allowed to do it. Originally, I think Mayor and Council came from DJ and he's not here tonight, but we had a hand in um, kind of revising this too. Um, so what this does is allow one non-conforming use to be replaced with another non-conforming use when that use first use is gone. I think this originated out of probably Doc Roberts office over there. And uh, the fact that uh, he's out of there, he's retired, and I believe there's an accounting office that's uh, looking at that right now so that you don't have a, a uh, building that's uh, just going to be vacant for a long period of time. So they would go through, the, the P&Z uh, would go through a uh, special review use, just like they do on most special review uses. And if they... Uh, and use those same procedures of uh, notifying people within uh, 300 feet of the whole area of the use that's coming, et cetera, and then have a hearing on it so that it doesn't necessarily have to go before uh, council uh, and make a determination if it's a lesser impact uh, than what is there now, then they'd be able to approve that. So they would consider the impacts uh, including, but not limited to levels of auto and truck traffic, hours of operation, noise, dust, vibration, nighttime lighting, glare, all those types of things. So that's what this ordinance does is, because uh, otherwise you would have to uh, not have a, uh, uh, an unperformed use there. The building would probably be vacant for a period of time. So that, that fills that void in other words. Any questions on that? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Make a motion to approve on the second reading of ordinance 925 amending chapter 12.3.260 of the Monte Vista Municipal Code. Second. It's been moved and second, seconded to, <clears throat> to approve ordinance 925 amending chapter 12-3-260 of Monte Vista Municipal Code. Is there any more discussion? Nita? Councilor Howard? Yes. Okay. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Councilor Watson? Aye. Mayor Pertin Sabella? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. 
Motion carries yeah. to approve second reading of Ordinance 925, amending Chapter 12-3-260 of the Monta Vista Municipal Code. Okay, contracts, agreements, and leases. Award the taxiway and taxi lane project to Asphalt Constructors, Inc. <laughs> Mr. Vance. Good evening, Council. Um, tonight in your packet, you have uh, a letter of recommendation from our airport consultants, the Aviation Planning Group. Um, we have sent out to bid uh, a packet for the projects at the airport this year, which is a construct a taxi lane that would extend hangar space to the west of where their hangars currently end, well, south. And then um, to go in and widen the existing taxiways that actually access the runway um, so it's easier to turn. A lot of the planes can't make those short 90 degrees, so we'd be adding some fillets so we could people could make those. And even my plow trucks in the winter can't make those. So we did advertise, we received one bid back for that. And the bid was from Asphalt Constructors and came in at $300,716 for the construction of the taxi lane. And then widen the taxiways came in at 579, 535. And both projects are within our scope of budget. So, um, at this time, I would like to recommend to council to award this contract for both the taxi lane and the taxi way to Asphalt Constructors. And I'm open for any questions you have. You're looking at the bids, all of them contain contractor quality drill program, which is a fair amount of money in each yes. one of those. I mean, in that, if you have a sense of what that other has to do, but. So what it is, is to have a um, QC person on site while yep. the project is going on to make sure that asphalt constructors does the job according to the plans and specs. It is a federal requirement. Is that somebody not employed by asphalt? Correct. It has to be a third party. Person. Third party. Okay. Do we know who that is? Do not at this point. Not that we go under contract. <clears throat> what does unit price in words mean? What's that? What does unit price in words mean? They have to actually write it out. So instead of using numbers, they actually have to physically write out $184,000 or whatever the, that happens to be. Okay. And we got the email today from Senator Bennett's office saying that, um, so it'll probably be in the newspaper, that we did receive. $384,412 from the Department of Transportation for this project. We are well with it. And, and, so, and so where does all the funding come from again? A Department of Transportation. State or Fed or both? This is the federal money. Okay. Correct, Rob? It's, it, it's a combination of both. Yeah. So part of this program is under the BIL, which is federal dollars. And then the Department of Aeronautics, CDOT, has partnered up with another 300 and some odd thousand dollars for it. So, yes, so it is well within budget. Yeah. If you are so approved, I would appreciate a motion to award to asphalt constructors. I make that motion to award the contract to asphalt constructors construct. What do you call it? AIP project 3 0 a 0 4 2 0 one 9 20, and the associated project along with that. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve the contract to asphalt constructors. Is there any more discussion? You need it? Councilor Howard. Hi. Councilor Loren? Aye. Councilor Watson? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to award the taxiway and taxi lane project to Asphalt Constructors. On the hot seat one more time, so I'll go ahead and stay up here. Um, so instead of an actual report tonight for the works of public works, um, I needed to bring to you 
discussion on the railroad. We've had a series of discussions, DJ, myself, and, and um, Gigi with the railroad about certain things. If you remember last year, I brought to this council an idea of possibly having to close a couple of our intersections where the roads cross. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, I did go ahead and get with the emergency services to kind of see where they felt. Um, we worked with the railroad and narrowed it down from the original eight down to four. And then the emergency services kind of put their, their two cents in. And we decided that if we were to close some intersections, those would be Faraday and Franklin Street. So... With that, um, we had so, another meeting. Oh, so, Rob, so remind them which one would be Franklin and then figure it out. So Franklin is the one just before you get to the Marsh School Park, right before the skate park on the, I would call it the west side of the skate park. Mm -hmm. And then Faraday is the road where it crosses that dirt road all the way down to the 6th Avenue. So it doesn't really have a lot of citizens on it or anything. Else. That's right on the other side of the old the co old co-op building. Right? Two blocks away from that. Two blocks to the east. Yes. Very few oh. houses on that street. That's where Lewis has had his car sales. If you all oh, okay. Yeah, that's where that is. So they're considering just cutting off the way to go through down to six. Correct. So what they would do, um Sanders with that is they would close it on the south side of where the railroad tracks are. They would close and barricade it. And then on the north side, they would do a combination of whatever you want. So on Faraday, they would basically remove all traces of the road coming from the highway in and restore it to native ground. So it would look, and it could still be used for people to park and do anything else. It just would not look like a road. On the Franklin side, they would give us our choice of either removing the asphalt and prepping the area so we could extend the park so that section of the skate park and the other section of Montez would look like one single park, or they would leave the asphalt in and we could try to construct more of a parking lot at that area. So it would be our choice as to what we wanted. But they would barricade both sides of the rail crossings and handle all of that cost themselves. And, so, the and the benefit to the railroad. And the benefit to the railroad is it, it gives them some benefits to their liability insurance. The less crossings they have, the, the less they have to pay on their um, insurance. They have also <laughs> thrown out to the city um, that they we pay the city, we pay the railroad for two leases, one for Montez Park, and that one's a monthly charge of $427 a month. And then for Fulminator, we pay them another fee once annually of $556. And they would eliminate both of those leases and we would not have to pay any further. What about the bathroom, the park bathroom? That stays. Yeah, so that was a one-time payment. We okay. paid that four thousand, and it's done. Okay, we don't have a monthly pay on that one. Okay, so, um, so anyways, the meeting today um, had a couple of new changes that could benefit Monta Vista a little bit better. Um, they have been working with the COG, the Council of Governments, in applying for grant funding for the whole valley to improve and upgrade some of the crossings throughout the valley. Um, and then if money is willing to move forward with those two closures, it opens up another funding source, which is called Section 130, that will not only pay for mm -hmm. the closures, but it will also pay for the upgrades to the crossings at Adams and Jefferson. So um, while it's not an absolute, the engineers feel confident that the closures will push that project to the forefront for funding. Um, so we could actually, uh, I'm sure all of you know that the crossing there at Adam Street is absolutely horrendous. Um, Jefferson is another one, not necessarily so hard to drive by with a vehicle, but they've had a series of 
every year there's at least one car that will derail on that that crossing. So it will upgrade both of those and kind of make our downtown a little bit nicer to travel. So, so what what I'm seeking tonight is a a nod and a motion from council to go ahead and move this project to public notice. I'm not asking you to make a decision at this time to approve the closure or not to approve the closure, but to allow DJ and myself to move it to public notice. Um, our plan as it stands right now is after tonight, if you do approve the public posting, we will post for public hearing for May 2nd, which is a regular council meeting, and we will open the public comment at that point. We will create a series of surveys and forms that people can either do online or hard copy um, to give their opinions of those closures. We will keep that open from May 2nd to May 23rd. We will close the public comments and then provide all the feedback to city council by May 30th. So you would have some time to review those comments and come up with some ideas. Um, we would have a first reading of the ordinance, specifically closing those intersections, um, those crossings at Faraday and Franklin at the June 6th council meeting. Um, second and final reading would then be posted for June 20th. It takes 30 days after second reading approval for the ordinance to actually go into effect. So the road closures would take place on July 22nd, which is outside of Stampede. So we wouldn't be impacting any of our big events. Um, while all of this is going on, um, we've talked about doing communications. We would have posts in regards to this on Facebook. I'll do a PSA, an article to the newspaper. We'll post everything on the website. And then we will send specific letters to all residents within a 300 area of both of those intersections so people know they come. Um, I will also um, purchase some custom signage for each of those intersections either side saying that this intersection is proposed for closal and give some instructions as to what they need to do if they have any comments on that. Um, Yes. And excuse me, and the railroad said that they would help participate in those public hearings. So that would put so it is a partnership and they said that they would help yeah. explain, you know, the liability side. No, on those streets there, there are no flashing lights, there's no arms that come down when a train does go through. And so, you know, stressing the public safety side of of it and then the benefit. The city is going to be given the parks. So. But then it'll block off two streets. Two streets. Both, right. both intersections, or if you will, those crossings. So as you come up, speaking for Franklin first, as you come up Franklin, there's that little dirt road that cuts across the Lyle, which is just a block. Um, Lyle, we didn't want to close that one simply because Marsh School is right across. And they use Lyle as their drop-off zone for kids. So if you look at that area in the mornings and then also in the afternoons, people are using that side of Lyle to get in queue to get in to either pick up their children or drop them off. The buses use the alley, so they, they're not impacted at all by the closure. Um, and then Faraday, like I said, it is a dirt road. It gets very little ADT, very little traffic during the course of the day. So I think that's a logical one to close. And I don't think and it also has a, a frontage road that takes it over to Stalo, and then you can access the highway. So access to the highway is literally one block, either east or west. So, so do you need a motion or you just-, just I do need a motion for us to move to, giving us permission to move to public notice. So I make a motion to move this to public notice. Second. Then moved and seconded to move the street closures to a public notice. We have one more discussion. Nina? Councillor Howard? Yes. Councillor Lorenz? Aye. Councillor Watson? Aye. 
Mayor Pro Tem Sibola? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to allow for Rob and DJ to move forward with the public notice for the closure of Faraday and Franklin for railroad crossings. And then the last thing is we started our street project. That one was carried over from 2023. It started on Monday. Um, they're in process of doing demolition to Batterson and Forth. Um, hopefully late next week, we will have enough done that they can start the curb and gutter. So bringing in some dirt and stuff to start laying the curb and gutter down. So projects moving forward. So Batterson's going to have curb so, gutter yes. pavement? So, yep. So Forth to Batterson and then Batterson down to Lariat will have curb gutter, sidewalk, and a new asphalt bed. Dennis is only going to have the same as the other three roads before it, the 24 foot wide asphalt path, and that we'll have to come back and, and do later. But being that we have the fire station, we have a large church, we decided to go ahead and do that as a full street replacement just so people can kind of see what that looks like. So they're moving, they're moving really well. Um, 227 semi loads of dirt are being removed from those two roads right now. So, several thousand tons. I have to say, Rob, I'm impressed with those street sweeper. Good. It, it does a nice job on the curb. Right? It, it's doing really well. So, <laughs> um, we're going to, once we get our staff back up to full status. I'm hoping to use the, the old sweeper and the new sweeper that's going to run in tandem for a couple of weeks so we can pick up all of the debris and then have the, the new sweeper kind of come in and just kind of sweeten everything up. So it cleans it well. Yeah. And then it stays so far. It stays off on off the road. It's too. it's it's funny because it looks smaller than the other ones, but the actual hopper is twice the size. So the, the Elgins that we have been using. The hopper size is four yards. This machine has a six and a half cubic yard bucket. Yeah. So it holds considerably more material before it has to dump. And it's kind of looks like a bug. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Council. Has Thank the you. kids named it yet? Uh, we haven't got through that quite yet. The end of April. What's up? The end of April. The end of April. We've gotten 17 different names, and you guys will make the final. You'll pick the name on May 7th. <laughs> it's going to be tough. <laughs> hey, though, it's sitting here. We just thought it might be kind of a fun political thing. <laughs> <laughs> Something positive about government. Yes, they, <laughs> positive. They, <laughs> all right, city clerk report. going to pick a fight and it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you get, you get that little, little <laughs> or we can turn it back over to a fourth grade class and say, you guys pick. Exactly. You know? <laughs> Good evening again. Um, just want to go over a few things with you. Um, so I got 28 applications for the deputy clerk's position. I will be interviewing 10 applicants between the 10th and the 11th this month. Um, the courts, for April, we have 36 cases. Six of them are code criminal, 10 are traffic. The rest of them are reviews. Um, on May 21st, I will be hosting the 2024 district um, eight CML meeting. Thank you, Dale. Welcome. Thanks. April twenty fourth. Um, you said twenty first. May twenty first. Twenty first. Wow, you're even on a state or a, a month on that one. So it'll be out at Sky High. Um, hopefully, you all can make it. Baldos will be um, doing dinner. We'll have a taco bar. Um, Rio Grande or RG Bank is our sponsor this year. They are sponsoring the social hour and the Elks will be serving the wine and beer this year for us. Um, I haven't heard back yet, but hopefully we'll have 68 West from Adams State who will be our entertainment 
for that evening during the social hour. What's that? And sixty eight West. Yeah. They're the a cappella group um, out of sixty eight West, or rather out of the state for the choir. So for Councilman Howard and Watson, you guys should be attending these meetings <clears throat> if you can. I don't know if Jason ever has. <laughs> it's only but, like but, <laughs> but they it gives you an opportunity to sit with other municipal um city council members exchanging ideas and then each community gives an update on what we've got going on in our in our community. So um it's it's nice to have Monta Vista represent representatives attend since it is and since we are hosting. If your spouses want to come, they're welcome as well. <clears throat> Sometimes spouses go. And if so, spouses go, it'll be $15 a plate. Um, my spouses do. <laughs> <laughs> and then Kevin Bomber will give a legislative update that evening as well. So what's the name of this again? Uh, the District 8. District 8. CML. CML. Mm -hmm. And that they'll give a legislative update as well. This is the legislature, thank God, will be done by then. So, and this is on March or May 21st? May 21st. What time does that? Um, it starts at 5 o'clock, is a social hour, and dinner is at 6. And you're getting your report already? Yeah, I'll be better prepared this time. Well, I can't throw you under the bus on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you all have your CML newsletter in your box, if you could pick it up on your way out. Um, in it is the Supreme Court's ruling on officials and social media. Um, if you all could pay attention to that and just be really careful what you all post on social media, um, especially you all being city council members, um, what you post on social media could reflect back on you all as council members. Um, you have to remember that you are a board of five, not a board of one. So you all have to make a decision together and you can't make single decisions. So what you post on social media could be reflected as you're making a decision for the city. So pick that up, read it, just make sure that you're aware of those decisions that you make when you're posting on social media. Do we have somebody who, like, the, the, all the Palo Alto do a bunch of stuff on social media. Do we have somebody who is assigned from staff to do that? So I do run the Facebook page. Okay. Um, and I do, I kind of, I, I watch Facebook and I watch what everybody posts. Um, I try to make sure that I reach out if I see something that's being posted by staff or by a council member. I do reach out and say, hey, be careful, watch what you're posting. Um, I know that council member Watson um, had posted when there was a bunch of conversation about the power outage. Um, what he posted was nothing pertaining to city council it was just saying, hey, we're working on the Sky High project. Come to council and you'll find out what's going on. Um, so comments like that is one thing. But if you're going to post on social media and make comments saying, this is what we said or this is what we're doing, those are the type of things that you need to watch out for. So I do patrol social media and I try to keep a very close eye on what's being said. So really if we had I any, I really right. just wanted to be my friend on Facebook. So really if we have any thoughts we should really communicate with you and let you keep posting everyone's right. And we did post um the press release on Facebook in regards to, um, like what Brad said, in regards to, yes, we are in the process of working on the generator project. 
it's not set up. But I, you know, I just kind of wonder how many people, even if we had the generator in place, how many people would really go down there and spend a few hours in there's you know, unless they bring their own che checkers board and play Yeah. Well, I mean, you'd have to spin it up as an emergency shelter, go through that whole process. Yeah, most of the time, you don't know how long that power out is going to be. You know, I'm sure, did, somebody sent me, or I saw somewhere, maybe it came from UGG or somebody, the explanation from excel why it was so long um you know that, that's the new world in, in the power industry is they're not going to re-energize until they put their eyes on the line that they suspect you know it went off at midnight at 11 59 yeah, that was kind of odd you know i get that cost some Conspiracy yeah. theory. Yeah, there's a lot of things about it that just didn't seem right. Yeah, I mean, but you know, I mean, that you know, wildfire is, is, is enormous in, in the electric utility industry. The fear of starting something, and not just the Marshall Fire. I mean, you have California, you have, you have the Black Forest Fire some years ago, down you know, the Colorado Springs. You know, the fear of wildfire in the power industry has um, just become a. a a gorilla that you almost can't deal with. Um, you almost get to the point where you can't buy liability insurance. And if you can, it means double or triple or anything else. So that's the big thing. And it didn't surprise me. That night I was, that day, the morning, I was traveling uh, to Denver. I saw a bunch of icing on the line between Willow Grove, and, between Swatch and Willow Grove. And I, I think that probably is what happened is that they had a fault on the lines. They have any problem, but you know they're just not. It's the middle of the night. They don't have people, and they're not going to re-energize that thing until they know that there's no line in the ground. So, plus Excel is just a monster of a company. There is no recourse. There is nothing you can do. I mean, they okay. basically changed the code on us. Just well, it's not just Excel. Yeah, it, it, it's every electric utility in the country. The fear of wildfires is driving the practices of electric utilities. Fundamentally, it's driving the practices of utilities. I mean, I go on and on. I don't want to do that. But I mean, the old they had a device called a recl a recloser. You know, that would after thirty seconds of a fall try to reclose in. <laughs> Fundamentally, most places have given up on reclosers. They don't. Do it. They put them in what's called a one shot. And if it opens up on a fault, it stays open until they put eyes on it. And that's the big thing in the power industry in the last five years, 10 years. And so outages like that that you see, it extend, they're going to be extended outages. Get ready for it. Um, one of the other big things on social media is I've had the question, um, why don't we delete comments that come across Facebook? Um, some of the comments that come across Facebook, especially on the police page, why aren't we deleting some of the comments? We can't. We can't um, violate someone's First Amendment rights. So the city does have a program that we pay for that monitors some of the comments. So if there's foul language, if there's threatening comments, those comments are captured and they are hidden from the public. Mm -hmm. And then I get a report and IT gets a report on those comments. And then we can review those and filter those. But we can't delete comments just because we don't like what they say. So that's also in the pamphlet. So you can review that. Um, two more things just really quickly. CML conference is coming up. So if you're interested, please let me know as soon as possible so I can get you registered. The hotel is already sold out, so I, if you're going to go, I need to know so I can get you booked at the next closest hotel. When is this? Uh, the 16th through the 21st of June.
And then the last thing I wanted to go over with you is the city or everybody is um, under what we call the ADA requirements. Um, so we've put together a team. The team that the city has is myself, uh, Brandon Gallegos, um, Shannon Griffin, our new HR coordinator, and Rob. We are your ADA team, and we will be making sure that the city is ADA compliant. Um, Shannon will be handling the HR stuff. Rob will be handling the buildings and grounds, and I will be handling the IT part along with the IT staff and Brandon Gallegos and Doss. Um, I'm proud to announce today, Brandon Gallegos and myself, we applied for a SIPA grant to help purchase a program that will allow us to send all of our documents through to make sure that they're ADA compliant. So when we do have to put a document on our website or Facebook, that it's ADA compliant, um, we were granted that um, grant today. We were awarded that grant today. So we did get it. Um, we have to have a plan in place by July 1st. So the team is working on that plan and we will submit that plan by July 1st to the state. And then we will start doing training for staff to make sure that everything's ADA compliant. I'll send my wife over to check it out. That is very, very easy. <laughs> Lauren. <laughs> I don't know if that's ADA compliant. <laughs> <laughs> you might be reading about Lauren and Franklin. IT report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good Thank Council. you for speaking as per usual. So Sky High is a busy month for us again, as we heard that there's some networking issues out there during Ag Conference due to the amount of uses that was on the network. So to kind of help with that, we put three AT&T cell boosters within the building, all paid for through AT&T. They just gave us the cell boosters at no cost. We are currently evaluating the wireless network and it is currently running at a higher speed than it was during Ag Conference. And we are still evaluating how many access points we have in the building which the access points are the wireless network access points that a lot of people connect in and use the Wi-Fi. Sky High has- How many do you have out there right now? Uh, we have 28 in the building. I've cut down 10 and we've seen the speed increase drastically. I was not a part of the original spec of the building. So the amount of access points in there, I don't understand why there was 28. And that's a bit much for the square footage of that building. So lot. we're kind of cutting them down and figuring out which ones would be best to keep alive. So that way we have a mesh network still. Sky High has some HDMI port issues in the yellow room in particular. They have a dead unit seemingly behind one of the TVs. I am working with Brandon Gilling with uh, Rocky Mountain Fire to get in contact with Beacon to get that system replaced, hopefully under warranty, so that way that's no cost on Stephanie and her staff. PD has some new laptops that will set up for their investigators. They are entirely for the investigators to do what they need to do without IT being there to kind of intervene and have to be there put in a password for them to download some software. This is essentially to allow them to do their job a little bit more effectively without being locked down to a secure system in a sense. Over the past month, I pushed a Cassell update through. It was a experimental update requested by our financial department as there have some issues with the system not running properly. That update did fix the issue that they were running into, which was with the reporting side of things. And that report, not that report, that update is now fully live and fully released by Cassell. So it's now a full release instead of exper experimental release. I've been verifying the system functionality or the internet slash server functionality after the power outages that we've been facing as to seem to be one at least once a week by this point, which, you know, who knows what's going on. I know there's a power pulse hacked recently, so see how well that keeps going. <laughs> And then general phone system changes as well as we've been dealing with big departmental changes as HR is no longer Judy, it's now Shannon, and Judy is moving into taking over the finance director position. So I've been working with them getting the phone system updated as need be. And then I want to touch back on Brandon Gallegos as you need to mention him a little bit ago. He is our new IT director for the city of Alamosa and the city of Monta Vista. So I just wanted to let you guys know that if you guys have any issues, Brandon Gallegos is a guy to go to. And he is extremely excited to continue working with everybody.
Any questions? Not for me. Anybody? Thank you. I appreciate Alrighty. what you do, man. Yes, sir. You guys have a wonderful evening. And I also just want to throw this out there. I am out of office next week. However, if you guys need anything, Brian Gallegos and Christian are both available. So if there's any issues, please contact them. Thank you. Very good. Thank, Thank you. City manager. Oh, man, she got a big piece of paper. <laughs> you only got two little things. <laughs> um, I've been out. My husband had his knee replaced, so I really don't have anything to update you on, except staff is working great. And we did have um, some <clears throat> first amendment auditors in the office this week. I think since April 1st, this week has just been kind of squirrely. Uh, first amendment auditors come in walking in with their cameras and kind of their purpose is to provoke the police into arresting them for something. They showed up where? Here. So they've been to Alamosa County, the sheriff's office. I don't know where else, but anyway, they were here this week. First Amendment auditors, are they their own thing? Uh -huh. Yeah. Is this part of like sovereign citizen type thing? Kind of, yeah. And so, you know, so then the idea is you arrest me and I can prove that it wasn't a lawful arrest. And yeah, they can put them on notice and fine them. Yeah. Yeah. Up to a trying, to get a, trying to get a lawsuit, basically. Yes. yes. I don't quite understand it. I, I totally understand the state national thing. I totally understand that. But if you don't want to take part, then don't take part. It's like, why well, you have to go in and make issues with everybody else. But so there was that excitement. <laughs> uh, we we got the initial plans back, and I'm going to go to the school board meeting on Monday with DJ and Durbin. Um, the plans and how they will look with the ball fields out at the middle school. And so, although we've been helping and it's a partnership, the grants and everything are being written through the school. And so it kind of helps leverage things better. So I'm kind of stealing other people's thunder, but um, we'll be showing you all of that. So it's pretty exciting stuff. And that's kind of it. Do we have any, going back to Larry Brown, and I kind of asked if we had any, do, would we have any money in the budget that you think we could make a donation? Yeah, the um, count, council has $4,000 that you guys have set aside that you can kind of spend for those sorts of reasons. <clears throat> we don't really have any rules on where you spend it. Uh, UNITA has given me a draft outline that we need to take a good look at so it gives you guys some structure but the one thing about Larry is that you know it's affiliated with CSU I was surprised he didn't go more into the funding of how they are funded and so the counties so the six county commissioners mm -hmm. they have to come up with a third of the money a third of it has to be raised locally and a third of it comes from CSU I remember all that correctly. And so, so it's actually the foundation he's talking about. Yeah. Okay. And so it's been a struggle with some of the counties in the, in the valley to kind of help keep him staffed the way he needs to. And so the struggle that they've had with, with losing, you know, what do you say, 10 years with one agent or something like that. So. Uh, I'd be pretty tough considering most of the people that were in it were from Mono Vista. So I'm trying to get the other counties involved. It's like they're not actively involved too much to begin with. But... Well, she she primarily just gave the Rio Grande County oh, okay. statistics. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we do host the whole, um, you know, the San Luis Valley Fair every August is out at Sky High. Mm -hmm. So they're solid. So I don't know. I just ask the others any interest in making a small donation from our meager funds of four <laughs> H <laughs> project. I mean, it's a valley wide project. It's, great. it's a good cause. Good cause. So, <clears throat> she said we have four. Are we willing to do two at least? Maybe. I would be more comfortable with one. 
Yeah, I would think we got a lot. Yeah, just in case something else comes up, we don't want to show total favoritism. What did we spend for last year? We used, uh, wasn't it the, the military? That was two years ago. Already? Yeah. Yeah, because we took some of our funds away and what we had mm -hmm. during the budget. Yeah. So that's, that's my concern with this. I mean, it's a good cause. But we also cut our budget significantly this year to the staff and plus we're different very, departments. We're very early in the year, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've had two in the thousands. So what if we did 15? How about that? Five dollars? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be okay with 15. Yeah, I make a motion for fifteen hundred. Seconded. Not much. It's been moved and seconded for the council to donate fifteen hundred dollars to the uh, CSU in, or is it 4H, the 4H, 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 4H in down in Dallas. No. Is there any more discussion? You need a Councilor Howard. Yes. Councilor Lorenz. Aye. Councilor Watson? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Cibola? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to donate $1,500 to the 4-H Endowment Foundation. Awesome. I think Larry will be very, very pleased, very happy. So, thank you. Uh, Joe, there's support. Yes. Right. That's it. Hey, Gigi, have you, has, uh, oh. So will we come in yet to talk? So. We have not met with him individually, um, but the three, the sense of three same people. So it's kind of like we've met his, the manager, but he's still based in Eaton and just comes down, hit and miss. And so the, the local manager, David Trujillo, came out with us today, and then um, their operations manager, I'm not sure what Luke does. Is he kind of like, he's, he's uh, like the he's like oh, the Gripper. He's no, the uh, what? Granny Gripper. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hey. Ah, I was running up through my head. Like, what's that? Mean? So, <laughs> well, I swear, a politician would know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, jobs are than the Granny Granny Gripper. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would think that he will be around. So if I get the opportunity, I'll make sure to tell him to make sure and come see you. He's an interesting fellow. Yeah, that's what I heard. I know they they're struggling right now. They had a derailment on the new pass oh, yeah. going over. So all the big engines are on that side of the pass. So. I just sure hope we get Adam Street fixed. North Adams, that's such a bummer. Yeah, you lose an axle on that <laughs> intersection. But I know that I mean, from, that's on my radar. So what they told me based on the conversations I've had for work. Well, and they were um, you know, they were feeding us along, but they were very complimentary about Mar Vista and us working with them as compared to a couple of the other communities in the valley. So we're like, you guys are helping us and we want to help you. So it was real positive. They talked about their building down by the park. Yep, oh. we talked about that. And it's kind of a cash 22. So they they own the yellow building They're behind the, the little the old train station, the, the ice cream shop. Or... Yeah, behind the ice cream shop. And we, it basically needs to be torn down. Rob would like to see us refurbish it. I think it should just go away. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, anyway, they're looking. They would like to tear it down. But the challenge with that is, is they do not want it to be used as a thoroughfare. And we want it as a thoroughfare because, you know, cars and RVs pull in down there and then realize yeah, there's they can't take it out. And how do they turn mm -hmm. that out? And so we talked a little bit about, is there enough that they could put some sort of fencing comfortably away from their tracks that then it could be used as a thoroughfare? 
um, which certainly make the utilization of full and wider park much more usable. Usable. You can't even really get a car turned around on that back. Yeah, yeah. Not very easily. Yeah. So it's still still in play. But for right now, it's gonna stay there. Do we have a follow-up uh, or a meeting to discuss the theater anymore? I mean, I mean, schedule somewhere? No, we haven't set anything yet. And that's partly because the last meeting then was Friday. And then that's when I took Mark out to go get the surgery. No, I, so I just I, never been around. Well, I'm not looking. What would you guys like to do? Or is there any public outreach on that? I mean, discuss and like, bring it to public too, where they can come and be actively involved in trying to decide what to do with it. Obviously, we have a budget. We can't just make it into things, but... Well... I like I to have a discussion with council. I have essentially have a work session. I know it's a public meeting, but... Yeah. So a work session. Yeah, it just has some discussion on yeah. where we're heading. And that's that's fine. We haven't had time yet to kind of look to see what other movie theaters have been, how to repurpose them. You know, the challenge, I think, Bob, is accurate. It's more of an emotional thing. I, we want the theater. How many of us are going? I know if we can just let let the public know that it doesn't pay for itself. I mean, it just can't well, we get over that. Itself. I think, but you know, I, I yeah. like to have a discussion about work session council and have have a have a conversation about it. Sure. Uh, Find a time that works for everybody. Okay. Be nice. I know Ag's getting ready to get with it. Jason, myself, and Brad are going to be swamped. Getting busy. So we need to try to figure that out before the end of the month, but after the 15th. April 9th? After the 15th. Oh, sorry. How did this end? Did you go to the water symposium? Yeah, did no, I didn't. Gene did. We can get some important. What's that? You <laughs> did. The water water symposium water. Oh yeah, Saturday. yeah. That was that was uh, actually very very good. I think it was uh, pretty forceful. Um, and uh, Robbins did the he was the keynote speaker on that. Um, but uh, all the speakers were really good, and uh, kind of laid out the history of the water uh, situation in the valley and the uh, fights that we've had to do. Uh, with, uh, you know, starting with the AWDI and then uh, Stockman's and then RWR uh, and so forth, where we are now, and uh, the sustainability issues and all that kind of thing. But I thought I thought it was very good. And then the, <laughs> the interesting part, too, was the Asequia people talking uh, from um, down in San Luis, uh, but more down in New Mexico. Where they haven't even tried to adjudicate their rights down there. It's just traditional rights and how that plays into the whole equation, too. So it was it was uh, very good, I thought. Did a good job. Right on. Thank you, James. Thank you, Gigi. Okay, we'll move to council committee, city commission, and council reports. Mr. Watson. Uh, Mr. Howard, I said my piece tonight. <laughs> You're going to be in trouble for it, too. <laughs> Victor? I don't know. Only if, if you... I don't know. Well, I'm not saying that. If, if something happens, I'm going to probably... Play. She's probably... Did you to... notice that she was yeah. up when she was yeah. on? <laughs> yeah, she's always going <laughs> to keep Margaret quiet, too. <laughs> Jason? Well, I have a list here. No, just kidding. Um, you guys, uh, like I said, uh, see something, say something. Don't be afraid as a public to say something. Because there's... Police are very good, but they need help. So see something, say something, and we will go recess the meeting until... One more thing. One more thing. One. When will we start looking for a new chief? So we have um, the applications are soon to close oh, and we're putting together a panel and the chief has said that he'd like to participate if we want him to. And so that'll be helpful. That'd be great. And um, so we're preparing questions and that sort of thing. So, so you're working on it. 
We're working on it. All right. Do you <laughs> have any applications that you have so far? Right now, we've got four. And um, one is, is a local out of South Fork. One's from Rocky Ford. Um, I can't think of the other two. Those two, Chief likes, likes them on paper anyway. So we're, we're moving forward. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Work session April 16th. I don't know, but it's going to take somebody to die here. I mean, <laughs> put the shovel down, man. <laughs> <laughs> shovel down. Uh, GG will be out of the office the 22nd, 23rd, so we could do the 24th, okay. which is a Wednesday. Sure. April 24th. April 24th. Wednesday. We make it. That's it's, also that's also um, the open house for, for Chief Dean Felder for, Chief Dean Felder, okay. uh, for a work session on the movie theater. Good. They haven't said yet. So six o'clock. Because Dean Felder, that's till five, right? Oh, uh, more like two to four. Two to four. Yeah. Thought it was posted one to three. I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> was it? Yeah. I, I just read it. Oh, I think I was probably about okay. too long. Yeah, it was one. All right. One to three. Or two to three. Yeah. Or three to three thirty. <laughs> okay. Work session twenty four. Six. Six o'clock. Yeah. Okay, so we will recess this meeting until April 18th, 6 p.m., Monty Strong.